Well, hello. Today I am here with Parker Henry. Uh, Parker is a, a former uh, UT student, so I got to know Parker uh, a little bit when he was in my investments class uh, at UT a few years ago. Uh, then Parker went on to graduate with a finance degree in uh, 2018, and then he went into the Master's of Finance program at uh, Vanderbilt, um, finished that in a year. And so now Parker is in uh, his second year as an investment banking analyst at uh, Raymond James, uh, based out of Nashville. So uh, here we are in the middle of COVID. So Parker has, has worked in person, and now he's working uh, online, seeing the whole thing. But, uh, but Parker, welcome uh, today. Thanks for uh, taking time to, uh, to chat with us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Happy to uh, have to do it. Yeah, so um, I, I, just to kind of get started, um, I'll let you know that many of my students right now that will be seeing this are uh, first semester juniors um, at UT. So this is really their first exposure uh, to finance. And so they're really kind of getting acquainted with different career options. And, and, and one of the paths clearly is investment banking. It's for some people, not for everyone, but uh, I, I wanna take just a little bit of time right now and, and ask you to kind of describe what this um, uh, kind of a, 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 an entry level investment banking job is. This sort of, uh, my understanding, it's kind of like a three year thing that you're doing right now as an analyst. So, so can, can you tell us about that? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, maybe it helps to start at maybe the 30,000 foot level and, and kind of drill down from there. Really, Raymond James specifically does a three year program uh, where you start in your first year and you kind of have some responsibilities that are a little bit different. And as you progress each year, you gain more and more responsibilities, but also more supervision um, you know, responsibilities, looking over the second and the first years as you move up to the third year. Um, really, what we do typically is, is a sell side engagement and a mandate. And uh, for maybe people who wouldn't understand the term sell side or buy side at this point, you know, a typical investment banking group um, like mine, what we do is we connect buyer and seller in a transaction. So as you mentioned, I work, you know, for primarily in the healthcare space, specifically in healthcare services. And really, what that means is that we're able to take, you know, groups of of doctors that have formed a practice or you know, a pharmacy company that wants to sell to a larger you know, pharmacy benefits manager and walk them through from the initial pitch all the way to the close of the transaction to sell them to, to the, you know, the buyer at the other end of the, uh, of the transaction. So really the bank can, can work on either side. Um, you can work on the sell side, which is, you know, as we just said, helping to prepare all the materials, all the content, building a pitch deck, which is a, you know, a PowerPoint deck, which kind of outlays everything about the company all in one succinct place, um, as well as building a financial model and a data room, which you know, helps to facilitate diligence and helping the buyer to understand the company at, at really a very detailed level. But you can also work on the buy side, right? And so the buy side is obviously on behalf of the buyer. And generally how this comes about is that a um, private equity firm or another large strategic firm who is looking to make an acquisition in a space um, will hire a banker who has been active on the sell side um, in, the, in the acquisition target that they're looking at. So obviously they have a very niche um, kind of role and, and unique value add in knowing the market multiples and knowing market valuation so they can come in day one and provide expert advice. It, it, you know, think about it almost like an expert witness in a, in a, in a case or a courtroom trial. I'm um, really able to come in and evaluate it objectively. Is this good or is it not? So let's just, so really, uh, just to, to, um, uh, get a little bit more tangible example. So, so uh, yeah. you started with, a, 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 uh, you mentioned a group of doctors. So there's a group of doctors. They have their practice in Knoxville. Um, there's 10 of them. Um, mm -hmm. They, um, um, they want to continue to be doctors, right? But the whole running the business aspect is maybe not what they want to do. They want to be in a bigger group. Um, that, so they sort of want to sell themselves, um, sell their practice to something bigger. And so that group of doctors would hire Raymond James to basically do everything right. on their behalf. And so everything would include things like actually finding a potential buyer? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
So yeah, so this is a great example. I always love to go to veterinary services. We love we love animals. Everybody loves animals. So uh, it's always easy to engage someone in, in animal talk. Um, so you know, we'll take a group of maybe ten or so vets. Um, they've rolled themselves up into one practice. So ten different veterinarians. You know, ten different practices across Knoxville and Knoxville Nashville area. You know, have gained some economies of scale by being bigger. They've lowered their expenses um, by better negotiating power, etc. And they hire us as the bank to come in and, you know, essentially professionalize their sales tactics, right? So building their deck, building the model, and then also finding and connecting them with the potential universe of buyers and negotiating the best deal that we can get them um, to take, you know, either a full sale, which is usually to a strategic, it's more of a full sale. They sell 100% of their equity. Um, which means they get a large lump sum payment. Um, sometimes I wish I was the one that was owning the practice. Um, but sometimes in a private equity sense, it's a recap, which means they sell a majority of it. So they no longer you know, are in control, but they also own a minority position. Um, and either way, we, we're acting and they're you know, negotiating as they're negotiating. Yeah, so, so this, this uh, um, you used the term uh, build a model. Um, and, and so... Um, is the is the outcome of that just essential? I mean, so you're sort of trying to come up with a number for the valuation of the existing practice that's going into the transaction. Is that sort of the goal here? Yeah, so I can kind of start back at, you know, so day one, when you go into a business um, and typically in a process like this, this group of doctors obviously knows their practice is valuable, but they don't know how valuable it is. Yeah. And they don't know who's the best banker to take them to market. So you start at the beginning, which is a pitch, and you kind of pitch what you think they're valued based on what the market says, other deals that you've done. You kind of outlay the initial buyer universe and you do that. Once you win the pitch, you know, obviously only one bank wins the pitch. It's an exclusive financial advisor relationship. Analysts like me, my job here is to initially begin diligence on the company that you are selling. And you learn everything there is to know about it. You know, all their legal issues, all their financial problems, all their, you know, just go-to-market strategy, sales, you know, kind of FTE status, all this stuff. And you use that to create the financial model that we talked about. And it's really taking all their financial statements um, for a period of time. You know, each process is a little bit different with how long you want to go back and how far you want to project forward. And you build an operating model, which shows um, really, if we take that for an example, I, I just built one of these models, that's why it's fresh in my mind. Um, we really looked at the appointment level detail and saying, okay, so this location, how many appointments are we going to project you know, going forward? And then that cascades down, well, if you have this many appointments, then there can be this much revenue. And if there's this much revenue, and you go all the way down to expenses. The bottom line of this and what the banker gets out of this model is it shows an EBITDA number. And that EBITDA number is what you go to market with and you guide buyers to say, hey, this is the EBITDA that you need to bid off of. Now go do your diligence, but this is what we're marketing. And then their team goes on their half and they obviously rework the EBITDA number that they try to lower way hard. down below ours. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's never higher. It's odd, right? Um, it's, yeah, it's interesting how that works, huh? <laughs> but uh, so, yeah, so they get, um, they do their own diligence and they come back. But the model is really there for a single beacon at the beginning of, you know, where we're starting. You know, are you even going to be able to be competitive on a valuation standpoint um, on this deal um, based on the initial EBITDA number? Yeah, yeah. So I, I think it's, it's, it's interesting to think about. Um, there's so... There's, there, there's someone that's basically doing everything that you're doing on the other side of the deal. And right. And y'all are, y'all are, right. if you ever get to the point where um, there's a negotiation, you've got your number, they've got theirs. And then you've got the number that you're actually saying and the number that they're actually saying, and you got to kind of sort of, sort of figure this out. And so it sounds to me like um, you've really um, sort of got to know your spreadsheet in and out. You've got to, You've got to know the entire market um, for for this particular thing in and out um, because if you don't, that's absolutely going to get exposed, right? I wake up at night um, terrified and sweat at all, and I'm not well enough. Uh, <laughs> you get on a call, and and obviously the majority of the people that you are competing against, I kind of see it as a versus type scenario. 
they've already been in my shoes. So that's typically the private equity firm on the other side. And those kind of pool of candidates that become the employees of private equity were at one time bankers. So not only do they know all the stuff that you know, but they know a lot more, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, quote unquote. And so you are um, always on your toes at any moment. They can just call you up and ask you, hey, I don't understand this assumption and it really doesn't make any sense. And your heart starts yeah. <laughs> really finding yeah. your chest. I hope that formula is not wrong. Um, but you always, you know, you triple, quadruple check it to make sure that you know your stuff. Yeah, yeah. So um, let's let's shift gears just a little bit since you since you mentioned um, the the person on the the other end of this transaction was formerly in your shoes. Um, can you talk just a little bit about what? Uh, so after a, 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 an analyst position on on the sell side, um, what are some common paths that that people tend to take thereafter? Yeah, so it's kind of broken down into four main buckets. Uh, it's probably the best way to describe it. One, which is the easiest, is that you just stay on. So using Raymond James as an example, we have a three-year analyst program. Uh, other banks have two-year analyst program, uh, and they can promote directly to associate. But it, the typical banking structure, for many of your class that doesn't know, is an analyst uh, for, one, for anywhere from two to three years program, and then an associate level for about three years is the average there. And then you've got a vice president position after that. And then there is directors and managing directors, um, which the VP can last as long as, as they want. Really, it's performance-based after that. You know, how do you bring in deals to, to, to get promoted? So obviously, the first step that you could do is, is called A to A in the industry, and it's analyst to associate. So after your third year, you get reviewed. Uh, you always get reviewed annually anyways. But at the end of your third year, um, your group reviews you and they make the decision whether or not to offer you a job or not. Um, if they don't offer you a job, hopefully you can find one fast um, because that means that you're not, you know, kind of the future of the group. They don't see you as, as really developing into a banker. That's option one. Um, probably the third um, most popular are the four options just because many people see banking um, as kind of a short term uh position and you know the hours obviously as i'm sure we'll get into later in this in this discussion kind of you know kind of dissuade people from going to the associate role really the most popular which we you know hit second is the private equity kind of associate role and these are the guys we were just talking about who build the models on the other side versus me is you know they've done their two to three years in banking and now they switch over from selling companies to buying them and working on the behalf of their, um, you know, their LPs to find investments, understand them inside and out, do the diligence, and then execute a, a strategy uh, for whatever fund they work for, whatever private equity fund they work for. And so that's definitely the uh, most popular kind of pathway out. Most people go into banking to get to private equity. That's mm -hmm. kind of a thought. Um, so that's number two. Number three would be what everybody in the industry calls as corp dev. It's corporate development. And that's really going and working at a firm, um, usually a more established, uh, most of the best roles are public companies um, or portfolio companies of private equity firms. Um, so private equity owned companies, um, they're, they're doing M&A for them. So it's similar to banking where you are finding these targets, um, but you're also on the buy side there. So it's kind of a blend mm -hmm. of banking and private equity, mm -hmm. but it's generally seen as a little bit less hours than banking. Um, with the benefits of private equity, albeit less pay, right? So there's a little bit of compromise and give there. The fourth option, which is definitely a unique one, it's it's more suited for those in the California and West Coast markets, is, is a lot of startups. You see a lot of guys after two or three years get a lot of experience in modeling and financial and understanding, and they want to go to a startup and try to go the IPO route and market a company through the whole roadshow process and, and figure out how to, you know, I always call it the, the strike gold theory. I'm going to try to go strike gold on a startup and, and not work after 30. Yeah. Um, that is extremely risky because you can find yourself without a job. That's right. Um, but that is probably the fourth route. Yeah.